Hello guys and welcome back to my channel. I hope that you can hear me okay. I'm actually out in the wild. I am filming a very special video for you today that I have teased for quite a while, as you can obviously tell from the title. This video is all about sphagnum moss, which we all know and love. So a lot of us know about sphagnum moss for the houseplant world, but do you know about sphagnum moss in the wild? Because I feel that a lot of the times when I come across it in the plant community or houseplant community, a lot of people don't really know that much about where it's from and what it is in the wild. So I thought it was worth its own special video. Sphagnum moss is also a very important key plant species when it comes to discussions around climate change and sustainability. Sphagnum moss it has many different uses, which I will get into, but a lot of it when it comes to houseplants and gardening can be very unsustainable. And on the topic of sustainability, I want to talk to you a little bit about Ana Luisa Jewelry. The reason Ana Luisa are a perfect company to partner with in particular on this video is because they are a sustainable jewelry company. They are carbon and water neutral and they're certified, which is very important. Being certified climate neutral means that they are held to very high standards where 100% of emissions from every single piece that they make is offset. This also means that their carbon footprint is tracked and they are set reduction targets that they have to meet in order to stay certified. On top of that, Ana Luisa also support carbon reducing initiatives like Cool Effect, which are a San Francisco based nonprofit, supporting initiatives like the Brazilian Amazon Rose Red Project and the Tri City Forest Project. Between them, they preserve a combined forest area of 6,500 acres, which sequesters 122,000 metric tons of carbon dioxide equivalent every year. As some of you may know, I am an ecologist and I do volunteer with conservation projects in my spare time. Because of this, I do know how important it is for companies such as these to give funding to projects like this. Oftentimes, they are not funded by any government. They are often charities that struggle by on fundraisers and they're doing really, really important work. Ana Luisa also work with the water footprint implementation, which means that basically all of their water used in their processes is tracked and reduced wherever possible. They also use recycled raw materials for a lot of their jewelry, which means that they're reducing water in the process and saving on CO2 emissions. They also support women empowerment initiatives in the US, need I say more? But all of that good stuff aside, which I love to start with because it's very important to me, but outside of that, they are a jewellery company and their jewellery is just absolutely beautiful. They're super beautiful, well-crafted, timeless pieces that will go with almost everything that you wear. Hello birdie, can you hear that? The pieces I got from them earlier this year, I still wear all of the time in all of my videos. If you've been paying attention, I have worn this in almost every video since I got it earlier in the year. This ring, one of my faves and I still wear all the time. And these earrings as well, I got earlier in the year. I can get around my hair and you can see what they look like. So if you are interested in picking up some pieces from this lovely company, it's coming up to Christmas, guys. So if you want to treat yourself or a loved one, you can click the link in my bio and use code amyadwan 20 which I will put on the screen for you, for 20% off. On top of that, they are also having a Cyber Monday sale, which is running from the 27th of November to the 6th of December. And during this time period, you can get buy one, get one 65% off, which is huge. It's a lot off, guys. So really make use of that if you were interested. There is a lot of consumers around this time of year with Black Friday and Christmas and everything and while it's always important to make mindful purchases at least if you are going to purchase a present for someone you're not going to reuse or recycle something then I really feel it's best to support those companies that are giving back and being careful with how they produce their products. So with that being said about one sustainable company I want to talk to you about sphagnum moss and issues around sustainability. So what is sphagnum moss? Sphagnum moss is a genus of mosses made up of over 380 different species and they're also known as bog mosses. Bog is a type of habitat. So what is a bog? Bog is a type of natural wetland habitat. 
And this habitat type accumulates something called peat, which is basically a deposit of dead and decaying organic matter and old sphagnum moss over time. These habitat types take years and years and years to develop. And they're really, really important for climate change because basically these layers and layers of peat act as a carbon sink, which basically means that it holds on to high levels of carbon that otherwise would be released into the atmosphere. Bogs are generally formed in habitats where the groundwater is slightly acidic and there's low levels of nutrients. So you must be thinking, with all of this dead and decaying organic matter, why are there low levels of nutrients? So despite it being over decades where the peat gets thicker and thicker in all of its layers, it's low in nutrients because sphagnum moss and peat in general don't really decay readily. In their cells they have something called phenolic compounds and this basically is a mechanism that plants develop to protect themselves from, from a various array of different things, whether it be diseases or pests or even strong UV rays and things like that. So sphagnum, although it um, is decaying, it doesn't readily decay and release its nutrients. For houseplants in general, you kind of don't use live sphagnum, right? So you're using typically dead sphagnum, but it doesn't really decay like other plant material would in your house, where it would get mushy and brown and be readily available for other things. Bogs have a really wide distribution across the world, and but mostly in the northern hemisphere, obviously, where it's a bit wetter. The world's largest wetland bog is over a million square kilometers wide, and it's located in the western Siberian lowlands in Russia. However, there's a lot of bogs in North America, South America, and in vast areas across northern Europe. The water retention in bogs is really, really dependent on the presence of sphagnum moss, which have a huge capacity to hold large amounts of water. As some of you may have realized, that's why it's so good for propagating houseplants. It really holds onto that water well. Now, because it's holding so much water it doesn't require other structural elements to keep it physically together so it's why it doesn't need things like lignin or bark and things like that to hold it in. It was even used in World War One as a dressing for wounds because it soaked up so much blood and stuff that it was really good to keep in the dressings. So the cell structure of sphagnum mosses is super simple it really only has two types of cells and one is for photosynthesis and the other is for holding water. So there is main, that's the main situation going on there. As some of you may know, I don't use sphagnum moss in my houseplant hobby. I haven't really spoken that much about this before. I've said a little bit on Instagram, but I haven't really delved deep into it because I wanted to do a full video on it. Now, the main reason that I don't use it is because these habitats are under immense pressure in the wild um, from over harvesting and things like that. So really, the reason I don't use it is because even the sustainable sphagnum moss brands, it's still very hard to be sure where it's come from and how it was grown and to make sure that it really wasn't taken from the wild somewhere. And because it's so difficult to find that out, I have just not bothered, to be honest. I've gotten way fine using other propagation methods and things like that and using peat-free compost. So peat is basically dead and decaying sphagnum moss over time, which has huge moisture retention properties and it's why it's so uh, widely used in horticulture. But peat historically, especially in Ireland, is also fantastic to burn. So peat bogs, especially in the past, were often harvested for turf, basically is what we call it in Ireland. I'm not sure if it's called that elsewhere, but it's basically where you drain the bog habitats by cutting drains along the perimeter, take out all of the water, then you can cut the peat into little bricks and dry it out. And once it's dry, it is so good for starting fires and for um, creating heat, basically. It's why so many bogs across Northern Europe in particular have been drained of all of their water. They still are today. There's a lot of bog restoration projects going on, but in general, they have been really, really degraded over time and there's very few intact, healthy bog habitats left. 
For agriculture, it's not great to be, you know, having livestock and growing things in super, super wet habitats such as these. So as well for agriculture, they were drained on top of that to make land more suitable for agriculture. And as well, it's also cut and used a lot for horticulture, as I said, your compost bags, your things like that, are all using this peat. I also want to note that as most of my subscribers are from the US, I thought I would add in a couple of facts that may be interesting to you. So 80% of all of the sphagnum moss used in the US is actually taken from Canada. In Canada, 1 60th of all the mass of sphagnum moss is harvested per year. Now, that may sound like not that much, but it is increasing year on year. But at the same time, Canada are trying to pull back on the amount that they harvest and um, put money into restoration projects. In England then, over 90% of the bogs in England have been damaged or destroyed over time. And when compared with Ireland, we're at 85%. So it's still pretty bad. And that percentage is excessively high, but it's true. And that's why I feel so passionate about it and it makes me really sad. I spend a lot of my time working outside doing field work and I see a lot of these habitats and I see the destruction that still goes on today. And I think it's very important to educate people and get them to understand simple things like you just want to prop your philodendron at home. But actually while doing that with a love for plants in your home, you could also be contributing to the destruction of habitats in the wild with plant species that we all love. So really with all of that background, I wanted to take the time to show you sphagnum moss in the wild. What it looks like, how it grows, how absolutely beautiful it is. And on top of that, some basic features of sphagnum mosses that you need to identify them, especially with the Irish species, which is obviously what I'm going to focus on because that's what I know. But on top of that, how to sustainably harvest a little bit for your houseplant hobby if you so wish. So when it comes to harvesting sphagnum sustainably, you want to think about three different things. One is the where, second is the what, and third is the how. So when it comes to where, you do not want to take sphagnum moss from a protected or designated habitat. So in Ireland, I know how to look up protected habitats and you're just going to have to take the initiative for whatever country that you live in, whatever resources that you have. In general, it could be the Department of Environment in whatever government of the country that you're in. So it's always useful to look this stuff up online. In general, you will find maps of some sort which will show you which habitats are protected. Please do not take sphagnum moss from any protected habitats. On top of that, even if you are outside a protected or designated designated area, that doesn't mean that you're free from areas that don't have a protected habitat. So in saying that, there are many protected habitat types that will be present outside of protected areas. So harder to figure out, but it's always good to have a look around and try to be sure that where you're going does not have any of these habitat types present. I do not want to be supporting or even encouraging people to take plants from the wild in habitats that are rare or protected. Please do not do this. When it comes to what, we want to know what we are taking. This is also very important. Now, a lot of you will not be botanists, will not have formal training in plant identification, but you are able to identify your houseplants. So you just need to push it that little bit further. You need to be sure what type of species of moss that you're taking. There are many ID books out there. There are often very useful keys that you can follow to figure out what species you want to take. Now, this is very important because in order to be sure that you're not taking a rare or protected species, you have to be sure of obviously the species that you're taking. So do your research, use online before you go, download little keys on your phone. You can get PDFs on your phone. You can even do it in the wild if you have reception. Just try your best to identify stuff before you take it. If you don't know what it is, or you don't even know like what kind of area of types of species that it is, 
just don't take it. Take from something that you definitely know is something common and widespread and easily adaptable. And the next is how. Now I'm actually going to demonstrate this to you because I'm actually going to take some sphagnum moss today while I'm out in the wild for use in a house plan project myself, which I will show you in a later video. So how you want to take it. You want to first select a large area of the same species of moss. So here we actually have basically some polytrichum moss, polytrichum commune, which is really beautiful. But if you look past this layer, we have sphagnum moss going on. We also have a big wet depression here where the sphagnum is basically concentrated in. And you basically don't want to deplete this large area. You don't want to be taking lots from one particular area. That's so that you're not disrupting the range or the distribution of the species and you're allowing it to basically regenerate itself very naturally. You want to select a piece of sphagnum in the middle or on the fringes of such a habitat and then when you've taken your piece you want to kind of squish it back into place which will encourage it to fill in any gaps that are present. If you do see sphagnum moss in the wild you will realize that it forms these kind of dense mats and in general there's no kind of big holes in the middle. Squish it back into place and move along. If you want more of the same common species, just move to a different patch. Take little bits from each patch to just distribute it, it out. As far as dealing with your sphagnum after that, I think I will do a short little video next on what you do once you take it back from the wild and you're taking it home. So I'll show you that process in one of my future videos. So when it comes to IDing the basic types of sphagnum. Now obviously I know that my subscribers are from different areas of the world so I was unsure about how to really approach this when it comes to ID because obviously as I said there's 380 different species. There's 24 of those are present in Ireland which I assume is similar to the UK but I thought it would be more beneficial to go through kind of the features that, of the moss that you need to use for your identification process, which may be more useful for you. And then you can look up a key or an ID chart or something in your own country. It's always fun to try this out as well. So for these 24 different species in Ireland, it is impossible to ID all of them in the field. Some sphagnum mosses, you absolutely need a microscope to fully identify them to species level. However, the common typical ones are doable with some practice. So I'm going to go through the features of a sphagnum moss strand, basically that you want to pay attention to when you're IDing. So these are the stem cortex, which basically means the inside of the stem. So you're going to have to cut the stem um, like perpendicular to get a cross section to look at the inside of the stem. Then you want to look at the stem leaf shape. So along each stem, there will be little leaves coming off it in the middle of the stem. You want to look at the shape of these. Are they pointed? Are they rounded? How long are they? Etc. Then you want to look at the orientation of these stem leaves. Which way are they pointing? Some are pointing up, some are pointing down, some are pointing out. The capitulum is basically the top part of the sphagnum. So in general, this is the part that is visible to you in those dense mats that they form. And you'll kind of have to pull the capitulum out to see the stem and all of the stem leaves. You then want to look at the numbers of the branches of the stem leaves and whether or not they are spreading outwards or pendant, which means down. Then you want to look at these branches. You want to look at the leaf size of these branches, the shapes and arrangements. You want to look at any juvenile or developing branches as well as the terminal bud which is basically the middle top part of the capitulum which is basically terminal as in the end it's the end of the plant as well as the shoot size so this will be like the full length of the stem and the capitulum and the terminal bud and all of the leaf branches etc so these are the main features I am going to use one of my favorite sphagnum and bryophyte moss ID um, guides, basically, which is tailored to Ireland and the UK. But I will put screenshots of this here just because I think that the diagrams for this are really useful and I would not be able to draw these better myself. So I will use them and the reference for this 
is included in the description box if you want to look at it yourself and you want to read a little bit. So if you use these features of each sphagnum moss type, you should be able to understand what species it is that you're interested in collecting or you just want to ID them for fun. Guys, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. It's the first of what I hope are going to be many videos outdoors. Um, I did put up a channel update where I told you that I'm going to be having a lot more free time because I'm changing my job and doing videos outside like this with plants in the wild is something I really want to spend more time on so I'd really appreciate it if you let me know in the comments if you enjoy this type of video and I will of course be doing more of them. As well I want to say thank you so much to Anna Luisa for partnering with me on this video. If you do want to support sustainable brands this Christmas and you're looking for some jewellery for a loved one or yourself, it's best to do it with a company with such great principles. So you can click my link in the description box. It is not an affiliate link, it's just a link for my subscribers. And use code AMYADWAN20 for 20% off. On top of that, for Cyber Monday from the 27th of November to the 6th of December, they are having a buy one, get one, 65% off. So please do support them. Thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope that you enjoyed it and I will see you very soon in the next one. Bye!